Mark chapter 15, and I'm going to start reading at verse number six. <clears throat> now at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him? whom ye call the king of the Jews. And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning that we get to uh, be gathered together to hear the word of God and to hear what you have for us, Lord, this morning from this passage of scripture. And I just ask, Lord, that as, it, uh, as we could consider it this morning and consider how Jesus took Barabbas's place there on that cross, I pray, Lord, that we'll realize that I was for our sins he died, that he died in our place. And I pray, Lord, that we'll just grow in our love and adoration, our worship of him. And I pray, Lord, that if there's someone that hasn't ever recognized that Jesus died for them, I pray that today will be their day of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Charles Spurgeon tells the story of how in Napoleon's time, in one of the conscriptions, a man was balloted to go to war and he didn't want to go but he had a friend who went in his place a friend that volunteered to go for him and so the friend joined up and he went off to the front and he was killed in action well sometime after napoleon wanted more men and by mistake he balloted the same man again and he said this time he said you can't take me i am dead he said, what, what do you mean you're dead? And he said, well, you can look it up in your books. Uh, you left me on the battlefield, buried me on the field in the last war. You cannot take me. Look up your books and see. Well, and they looked and they found that he had been killed in action. They said, well, it must have been a substitute. He said, yes, it was a substitute. He died in my stead. And now the law has no claim on me. He died in my stead. He died in my place. This Easter time, as we consider the cross and what Jesus did for us, aren't you grateful for the one who died in your place, who died in your stead? We're considering Barabbas this morning, and his story is a fascinating story. The name Barabbas literally means son of the father, and as a preacher, there are two ways that you can go in the story of Barabbas. You, the name Barabbas, you know, perhaps one day I'll go the other direction, but you know, you could consider the aspect that the Jews chose Barabbas over Jesus. You think of that terrible choice, the terrible choice. In that consideration, you would consider Barabbas as the counterfeit, the counterfeit son of the father. When Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God the Father. Jesus Christ is the real thing, but the devil always has a counterfeit that he wants you to choose. But the counterfeit is a thief and a murderer. And they chose the counterfeit rather than the Savior. But this morning, and we considered that actually on Friday night at youth group. So anyways, this morning, I want you to consider Barabbas as representing someone else. I see him as the son of the father, as a, 
You know, as even as Adam is called in Luke chapter 3, the son of God. And I see Barabbas in the text as someone who represents me, someone that represents you. I find him, I find him as someone who, that Jesus stood in Barabbas' place. And it reminds me how Jesus stood in my place on Calvary Street. As the songwriter wrote, in my place, condemned he stood. So this morning, when we think of Barabbas, I want you to think of how he represents us and how Jesus took our place. When I consider this passage this morning, I see number one, the insurrection. The insurrection. You say, what is an insurrection. An insurrection is rebellion. That's what insurrection is. Insurrection is a rebellion against authority. It's a rising up from beneath. It's a revolution. And Barabbas in our text was part of an insurrection, a rebellion in that city. Somehow during that insurrection, Barabbas not only committed theft, but the Bible tells us he committed murder. What was it? Was it a protest that turned violent? Was it looting where someone innocent got hurt? Was it a heist where they were stealing great treasure and something went terribly wrong? I don't know exactly what it was, but it was some form of rebellion against the authorities. And in doing so, he had rebelled against the highest authority, God the Father, and he was guilty and everybody knew it. There was not one person there that day that would have said that Barabbas was innocent. Everybody knew who Barabbas was. Everybody knew what Barabbas had done. It tells us in the text that Barabbas was a, in, in Matthew's gospel, that Bar Barabbas was a notorious prisoner. Someone that everybody had taken note of. He was the day he committed his crime. He was the talk of the town. If they had newspapers, he would have been on the front page. If they had internet, he would have gone viral. He was someone that everybody knew what Barabbas had done. And he was guilty. He had led a rebellion against God the Father. And he was guilty. And before we point the finger at Barabbas and say, look at how guilty that man is. Remember that the other four fingers they point back at ourselves because we're just as guilty. We also have committed rebellion against God the Father. And in our rebellion, we have committed unspeakable sins. We're guilty. The songwriter wrote, guilty, vile, helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. The Bible says that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that there is none that doeth good, no, not one. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none righteous, no, not one. They have all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We have rebelled against the Heavenly Father, just like Barabbas. You say, well, I never did what Barabbas did. You know, there's some people that, there's a pastor that's preaching against sin, and someone took great offense to it. He said, I don't like it that you make sinners seem so guilty. I, I don't think that I'm as guilty as the other sinners over there. The pastor said, well, I'll give you this. Maybe there are some notorious sinners and there are some respectable sinners. You can be a respectable sinner, but you're still a sinner. You're still a sinner. You're still someone that has rebelled against God. And just like Barabbas, we're condemned for our crime. Barabbas was in the prison house, locked inside the prison cell, chained with the chains of his own making, under the sentence of death, awaiting the day when his name would be called to receive a just recompense for the wrongs that he had done. Wasn't that us? Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin, in nature's doom. That was us. We were bound in the chains of our sin under the sentence of death. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. The Bible says in Numbers, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We were under the sentence of death. 
because of our insurrection, our rebellion against Almighty God. But I see then, secondly, the injustice. The injustice that someone so guilty would be set free. The injustice that somebody so guilty would be allowed to walk out of that prison scot-free while the sinless Son of God was sent to the cross in his place. You know, I can imagine that those that knew what Barabbas had done had circled the date on their calendar when Barabbas was to be executed. I can imagine the ones that he had wronged were crying out for justice, crying out for something to be done to this notorious criminal who had done great evil against them. And so they were counting down the days for his crucifixion. Their three crosses were made for that day for three thieves that were to receive justly for the wrongs that they had done. And this was the day that Barabbas was waiting for, the day that they all were waiting for, when they knew Barabbas would receive for the wrongs that he had done. And that day came, and I can imagine Barabbas in the prison cell, anticipating the call at any moment, when the soldier would come to his gate, and he would open it up, and he would lead him to Calvary's hill, where he would be condemned to die on that cross. And what a great injustice it is that when the soldier came to Barabbas' prison cell, he opened up that gate and Barabbas walked away free. What an injustice. Oh, so much un injustice in this text. I think of the injustice that Jesus Christ was ever placed on trial. The sinless son of God ever placed on trial, ever facing condemnation. How, how did he get there? He hadn't done anything wrong. Pilate could find no fault in him. Everybody knew he was innocent. Everyone knew that the Jews had only delivered him for envy. Pilate stood there and said, I find no fault in him. The injustice that Jesus was ever on trial. I see the injustice that there was ever a choice between Barabbas and Jesus. That it was ever even an option. Will you have this man or Barabbas? How can you even think of that as a choice? Pilate was simply trying to get out of making a decision. Pilate was playing a politician. He was, he was trying his best not to have to do anything. He had sent, him off, sent the Savior off to Herod, hoping Herod would make the decision for him. Now he had another idea. After Herod didn't do anything, he said, well, maybe if I give them the option of Barabbas. You say, why did they have between Barabbas and Jesus? Well, because Pilate thought there was no way they'd pick Barabbas. Barabbas, the... the I wonder if the other two thieves were the, with Barabbas, if they were all in the same crime. The Bible doesn't tell us if they were all together or not. But he was taking part in an insur insurrection where theft was being committed. The Bible tells us it was two thieves that died on the other two crosses. And Barabbas, though, was the one that in this insurrection had committed murder. Barabbas was the one that went the other, the, the more distance and committing this great sin. Certainly they wouldn't pick Barabbas. You know, Barabbas, the names Barabbas and Jesus, they don't even belong in the same sentence. Barabbas is unworthy to even have his name mentioned alongside the name of the sinless son of God. But everything changed that morning when someone else took his place. The injustice that there was ever a choice. The injustice that Jesus... Christ our Savior was ever condemned. Uh, Pilate would sentence him. That verse 15 would read that after he scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Uh, Jesus was sentenced to death. Why? What evil had he done? Pilate himself, the one who gives the sentence, asks the question, what evil has he done? He knows he's innocent. What is it that they had against him? Perhaps it was that he had healed someone who didn't want to be healed. Perhaps it was that he had helped someone who didn't want to be helped. Perhaps it was that he had fed someone who didn't want to be fed. Was it that he opened the eyes of some blind man who didn't like what they saw? Maybe that's what happened. What evil had he done? 
He was a lamb, meek and gentle, holy, harmless, undefiled. And the injustice is just so much worse when you consider that this man who had done nothing amiss was sentenced to death while this thief and murderer got off scot-free. The injustice that Barabbas got off scot-free while Jesus was crucified. The decision shouldn't have been difficult. You have the giver of life and a taker of life. You have one that has given us richly all things to enjoy, and you have someone who steals and takes what you have. What choice is there? But they chose Barabbas, and the sinless Son of God was led away to be crucified. How does that make sense? Except you realize this, that Jesus Christ had come for that purpose. He had come to save sinners such as you and I, he had come to save sinners like Barabbas. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We have the insurrection and the injustice. But I think thirdly this morning of the indebtedness. The fact is Jesus Christ, our savior, he died in Barabbas' place. He died for Barabbas. It should have been Barabbas on the cross that day. It should have been Barabbas that was led away to be crucified. It should have been him. And now he owes him a debt when Jesus took his place. Do you realize that we owe Jesus Christ, our Savior, a debt? We owe him a debt, a great debt. When you consider that it was my iniquities, it was your iniquities. All my iniquities on him were laid. He nailed them all to the tree. Jesus, the debt of my sin fully paid. He paid the ransom for me. Jesus Christ died for you. He died for me. That leaves us with a great debt. First of all, it leaves us with a debt of love. I think of Barabbas that day walking away scot-free, and I can't help but wonder. Does Barabbas ever consider the one who took his place? Does Barabbas ever stop and think about the one who died in his stead when he should have been the one on the cross that day? Does he realize it? The debt of love that he owes. We talk about the love of God and how he gave himself for us. I wonder if you realize that Jesus loved Barabbas just as much as he loves you or me. Do you ever realize that? We take John 3.16 and we say, put your name there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Put your name there. For God so loved Luke Higgs. I'm so glad I put my name there so many years ago. But you could also put Barabbas' name there. For God so loved Barabbas that he gave his only begotten son that if Barabbas believeth on him, then Barabbas should not perish, but Barabbas should have everlasting life. For God so loved Barabbas and how Barabbas owes Jesus Christ a debt of love. And this Easter week, remember this truth. So do you. So do I. We owe the Savior a debt of love. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We owe him a debt of love. Why is it that, why do I, I love him so much? Why do I love Jesus? Why do I want to tell my kids about Jesus? Why do I want to tell my church family all about Jesus and how wonderful he is? I'll tell you why. It's because I love him. And why do I love him? We love him because he first loved us. I wish I could tell you that I sought him out, that I was the one that initiated, that I was the one that went seeking for the Lord. But that's not the case. 
I was part of the insurrection. I was a rebel against his authority. I was in the innermost prison of sin. But he showed his love for me when he died for me on Calvary's tree. And that's why I love him. That's why I cannot help but love him because of the love he's shown to me. I owe him a debt of love, but also I owe him a debt of life. For Barabbas, you realize he got, all, he got a new lease on life that day. For days, ever since he committed that crime, Barabbas was a dead man walking. Barabbas was a man that was under the condemnation of death. He was a man that had no more opportunity to live. As far as we, he knew, that day he was going to be nailed to that cross. He wasn't to see the light of day until the day he walked up that mountain. But that day, he got a fresh lease on life. New opportunities to live. New opportunities to experience life, to love, to enjoy his family and friends. He had new life. All because someone else <clears throat> had died in his place. All because someone else had taken his spot on the tree. And <clears throat> Excuse me, I got to have a drink of water. <laughs> Nathan found that quite amusing. He gives me the giggles. It's a terrible thing. But <clears throat> what other response can there be to the, to the fact that Jesus laid down his life for us than for us? to give our lives to him. There's no other response we can give. Someone died for us. I, I, I see it in sports all the time where someone has a loved one that they lose. For instance, a family member, or in some cases, a, there's a former player or someone. <clears throat> and you see them put the, the number of that person on their jersey so that they can, or some sort of initials on their jersey so that they can say that they're playing the game for that person who they loved and lost. But this is even greater than that. Jesus Christ didn't just die. He died for us. He died to save us. He died for our sins. He died in our place. And what other response is there but to live our lives for him? Paul says in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by what Jesus did for us on the tree, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's just what's reasonable. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It only makes sense when you think of the cross. This is our reasonable service. We're indebted to the one who stepped in for us. We have the interaction. We have the, uh, we have the injustice and we have the indebtedness. And I wish I could just stop the sermon right there. I wish I could. But I have one more truth that I find in the scripture this morning. I find the ingratitude. The ingratitude. Now, perhaps I'm reading a little bit too much between the lines. But correct me if I'm wrong. Is there any evidence at all that Barabbas did any of this? That he loved the Lord Jesus? That he lived for the Lord Jesus? You say, I don't know. I mean, how could I know? The fact is, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about Barabbas after this. The Bible doesn't tell us about the life, the day he died. It doesn't tell us about the kind of life that he lived. And I can't help but wonder, what kind of life did he lead? You say, probably it was better than the one he led before. I mean, you got to think you get that close to death's door. And you got after that, you're smart, you're smart enough. You change your actions. Perhaps it did, but you know, I don't put any stock in tradition, but according to tradition, it didn't. 
according to the traditions that people have about Barabbas, they say that Barabbas simply got involved in another insurrection and died in the insurrection. Made no difference in how he lived his life. I don't know it. That's just tradition. What does the Bible say? Well, you know, that's just it. The Bible doesn't say. Now, I, I understand not everybody's name is recorded in the book of Acts. I get that. But the fact that this was a notable prisoner who everyone knew about, everyone talked about, don't you think that if he went on for the Lord, something would have been said? There's no evidence of it. Not even Christian tradition says that he did anything worthy of the opportunity he received at new life. And it's sad to consider, but it's also sobering because you've got to ask yourself the question, am I like that? Are you like that? What difference has there been in your life since Jesus Christ saved you from death? Hebrews 10 is talking to Christians when it says in Hebrews 10, 26, for if we sin willfully after that, we've received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the agency, the ad adversaries. It says, of how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. You know how terrible it is to be a Christian, to be saved from death because Jesus took your place and then to not live like a Christian, to go your own way once again. The fact that Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of God, died in your place, it needs to make a difference in our lives. Has it? Has it changed the way that you live? Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. There's only one thing you can say after that. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Is he your Savior today? Do you recognize that just like he died in Barabbas's place, he died in your place? It was for your sins he died. For your sins. This, uh, the Bible tells us the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He died for our sins. He died for you. He died in your stead. Have you received him? as your personal Lord and Savior. R.A. Torrey says, when Jesus died, he died as my representative, and I died in him. When he arose, he arose as my representative, and I arose in him. When he ascended up on high and took his place at the right hand of the Father in the glory, he ascended as my representative, and I ascended in him. And today I am seated in Christ with God in the heavenlies. I look at the cross of Christ, and I know that the atonement has been made for my sins. I look at the open sepulcher and the risen and ascending Lord. And I know the atonement has been accepted. There no longer remains a single sin on me. No matter how many or how great my sins may have been. All because Jesus died in my place. You recognize he died for you. D.L. Moody tells a story about the California gold rush. And how the gold fever broke out and there was a man that lived in New England who decided to, to go across the continent and to search for gold. And so he, he left his wife and his son behind and he went across and he was going to, as soon as he made enough money, he was going to send for them to come with him. Well, he was there quite a while and finally he had enough money and he sends for his wife and his son and tells them to come with, come to him. To California. And so I guess you could either go across the continent or one of the ways they went was they sailed around the great big continent. So they got in this ship and they began to sail. But it wasn't long before there was the cry of fire, fire that rang through the ship. Rapidly it gained on them and there was a, I guess gunpowder was on board and the captain knew the moment that the fire reached that powder, everyone on the ship would die. And so they got out the lifeboats, but the lifeboats were too small. In a minute, they were overcrowded, 
And the last one was just pushing away when the mother pled that they would take her and her boy. He said, no, we got as many as we can hold. So she entreated them so earnestly that finally they said, okay, we can take one more. The mother didn't get in the boat. The mother gave the son one last hug and kiss and dropped him into the boat. And she said, my boy, if you live to see your father, tell him that I died in your place. Now, that's just a little bit of what Jesus did for us. He died in our place. We were the one under condemnation. We were the guilty one. The cross should have been ours. But he died for me, and he died for you. Friend, how can you not love him with what he's done for you? How can you not live for him when Jesus Christ died in your place? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much. And you sent your only begotten son to die on the cross in our place. I'm so thankful, Lord, that Jesus Christ died for my sins so that I can be free and live forever with you in heaven. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know him as their savior, pray that that one will be saved today. I pray, Lord, that uh, if there's someone here as a Christian that's not living for the one who died for them, I pray that today they'll give their heart and life to you and that they'll live for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wonder this morning, is there someone that doesn't know the Lord is their Savior? If that's you this morning. Would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you and show you from God's word how you can be saved. Anyone at all. Also this morning, I, I wonder if there's someone, someone this morning that's a Christian. And just needs to give their life to the Lord and tell the Lord I love you and live their lives for you, for him. Would you make that commitment this morning? But I'm asking if you don't know him as your savior, would you raise your hand? And I or someone else would love to take a Bible and show you you can be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word. I pray, Lord, that you help us, Lord, to love the Lord and to live for him. In Jesus, we pray.